I will present our current design for the Axis High Speed X-ray Camera. And for those who don't know me, my name is Eric Miller. I'm at MIT and I'm the lead for the Axis uh, Focal Plane. Um, this talk actually is sort of two parts. The first part, um, I'm going to spend a little time talking about some of the challenges that Axis presents uh, for the uh, detectors specifically and then uh, talk about some of the performance um, that we've been able to demonstrate with our uh, detectors of choice. Okay. All right, and um, of course, uh, what I'm going to show is based on the work of a lot of people. So here is, are the development teams for the uh, AXIS focal plane. Uh, we have two groups. Um, one of them is a joint effort by MIT and Stanford to develop the CCD detector technology along with the analog analog electronics that need to uh, drive them. These groups are led by Mark Bouts uh, here at the MIT Kavli Institute. I'm a member of that group. Um, and our colleagues at MIT Lincoln Lab who will uh, eventually, who will design the, the, the CCD detector and eventually fabricate it um, are le is led by Chris Lights. And our colleagues at Stanford University um, who are uh, doing a lot of effort on the analog electronics uh, are as led by Steve Allen and Sven Hermann. Um, and then there is a group at Penn State led by Abe Falcone. Uh, they are working on the digital electronics and also the transient event monitor that I will discuss very briefly. Okay. Um, so uh, just to remind you of what AXIS is, hopefully you've been attending these sessions and you have a pretty good idea now. Uh, it's a quite a simple design for an observatory. It's a, a high throughput, high spatial resolution, uh, a fairly broad band X-ray imaging uh, uh, spectrometer. And so this is a little uh, rendering of the AXIS observatory. Here you have uh, the high throughput X-ray mirror, uh, and that simply focuses X-rays down nine meters away onto our X-ray focal plane camera, which I'll be discussing today. As I said, it's uh, the idea is here to have a very simple design to get the performance that we need. So this table uh, shows you the requirements for that performance. Um, again, we have a very uh, good spatial resolution across a wide field, uh, very good throughput, about 10 times the effective area of Chandra, a uh, fairly decent field of view, uh, and uh, broad band pass. Now, all of these um, uh, uh, all of these performance, actually, this isn't too far, uh, any one of these is not too far off from what we've been able to achieve previously. However, combining all of these really presents a challenge for the uh, camera that needs to detect these x-rays. Uh, and in particular, that, that challenge is we need to be able to run this camera very fast, greater than five frames per second. For comparison, on, on similar detectors um, that we have been flying on Chandra for 23 years and that we flew on Suzaku, um, we need to run about 20 to 40 times faster than those. So the performance of, the, of, the, of those detectors on Chandra and Suzaku actually is pretty similar to what we need for AXIS, uh, but the environment and the speed at which we need to do it is much more demanding. Okay. Um, and so in particular, what we really need for AXIS uh, is excellent soft X-ray response. And so all of these science topics, which I'm listing here, which I just kind of uh, listed off the top of my head, um, require this very excellent soft X-ray response. And if you've been attending these, uh, these talks for the past couple of months, uh, you probably have some idea about, um, about what I'm talking about. Now, um, these are terms that astronomers and instrument, uh, uh, instrumentation people like to toss around. What do I mean by soft X-ray response? Well, soft X-ray, basically down to the lower end of our bandpass, down to 0.2 keV, but everything below 1 keV is what I would consider soft X-rays for this purpose. Um, and response is, again, one of those terms that people tend to throw around. And specifically, what I mean by response for this talk, and I think what we really should mean by response, is the ability of the instrument to detect a photon at a particular energy and also to accurately measure its energy. Uh, it is, of course, the response of the instrument to photons of a particular energy. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about response. So we need to be able to both detect as many photons in this energy range as possible, but also accurately measure their energies because this is an imaging spectrometer. All right. Uh, of course, the very characteristics that make AXIS such a, a breakthrough and appealing science mission um, really conspire to make this challenging for the camera. And in particular, the high spatial resolution generally means we need to have small pixels so that we can sample that really good PSF. The high throughput 
drives this fast readout so we don't have photons arriving on top of each other. And then this broad energy band, in order to detect the, the hard end of this energy band up to 10 keV, we need to have thick detectors. But all three of these, uh, all three of these design parameters driven by this um, uh, make the soft X-ray response challenging. Okay, and so I think it actually is helpful for all of us if we sort of dive into how an X-ray uh, imager works. And this is true for an X-ray CCD, such as been flying on Chandra now for 20 years, um, or even a CMOS device, which we probably expect to see in the future uh, for a lot of these sorts of applications. Okay, so I'm gonna show a couple of movies here. And um, before I start them, what I'm showing over on the left is a uh, is kind of a slicer, little three-dimensional cube of a typical silicon uh, X-ray detector. And, and this can be a CCD or a CMOS device. Um, and so this is the thickness of the detector. If this one happens to be 100 microns thick, uh, this surface up here, which you can't really see, this is the entrance window. And so photons uh, come down here and interact somewhere within the silicon. Um, and we apply a, a voltage across this. So there is an electric field inside of the silicon, inside of the, the bulk of the detector. Um, when a photon comes in, it, it produces a photoelectron. And that electron being charged feels that electric field and is driven quite quickly down here where it's collected into pixels by these collection gates. I'm, I'm playing a bit fast and loose with the... Uh, uh, the vector, the direction of the electric field, but that's the direction that electrons will travel when they are produced. Now, in an optical CCD uh, or an optical CMOS, for that matter, um, an optical photon comes in and it has sufficient energy to to uh, produce one photoelectron. You get a one-to-one -one correspondence between photoelectrons and photons. And so, I'm not going to show the photons coming in, but what I'm going to show in the movie that I start now are these little red or orange things. These are electrons that are produced by those invisible photons. Um, and you can see they feel the electric field and they, they flow down to where they're collected in these pixels and they're collected there uh, for readout. But since you have a one-to-one -one correspondence of electrons to photons, you can integrate for as long as you want, as long as you don't fill up these the potential well of these pixels. And then you read it out at your leisure and the amount of charge, the number of electrons you've detected there, um, is proportional to the brightness in that pixel, the number of photons that were collected. All right. Uh, X-ray detectors, while they are exact, pretty much the same detectors, they detect X-rays in a different way than optical photons. Uh, an X-ray is energetic enough that it produces lots of uh, photoelectrons, tens, hundreds, even over a thousand photoelectrons. Um, and so I'm going to show a movie of that. This is now a 50 micron thick detector. You can see the pixels here are eight microns. They're a little bit smaller. The X-ray photon comes down here. Again, it's invisible, but it produces this little charge cloud of uh, tens or hundreds of electrons. And then those electrons feel that electric field and they quickly move down to where they're collected. Um, however, this is the pattern from a single X-ray photon. And you can see that this falls over lots of different pixels. And we, in order to measure the energy of this photon, we need to recover as much of this signal as possible. Um, more fundamentally, this tells you why we have to go so fast because we do not want another, uh, another X-ray uh, uh, happening at the same time that we're trying to collect this X-ray. You know, having two X-rays fall on top of each other means that we can no longer accurately, accurately measure their energy. And I do wanna point out that the software we used to run these simulations was produced by Craig Lage at UC Davis who, who made this movie. Um, and this movie over here was uh, done by an MIT undergraduate uh, named Jared Scott. And this is the work that our group is doing to try to simulate the effects of uh, what we call charge diffusion in these detectors. These are real simulations. These are um, actual physical simulations of solving for the electric field and then introducing photons uh, into, the, into the detector. Okay, um, so to explore this a little bit more, um, uh, I mentioned that we have this electric field that we set up across the detector in order to quickly collect those, those uh, photoelectrons. Um, and now I'm showing a, cut, a cutaway of something that's more like the Axis CCD. This is 100 microns thick. Um, again, this has fairly small eight micron pixels. And the reason we needed the, the CCD to be this thick, again, is in order to uh, detect the higher energy photons. What I'm showing over here are attenuation curves for photons of different energies. And so this blue shows a 6 keV photon. Um, these tend to... Uh, um, uh, attenuate at 30 nanometers, or sorry, 30 microns uh, into a CCD. Um, and in fact, 
they can actually penetrate a lot deeper than that. 10 keV photons can penetrate very deeply. So the thicker we make this, the, the better our quantum efficiency is at high energies. However, the softer photons, especially things at 0.5 keV and below, interact right at the very uh, top surface, right near the entrance window of this. And so that's what I'm saying in words here. Soft X-rays produce their signal up here, but that signal is not collected um, until they are uh, until they uh, uh, diffuse, till they drift and then and diffuse and are collected by the pixels way down here. And so that presents problems because of this diffusions. All right. So here are a couple of more movies. Now this is a, a six keV photon, which can interact at a lot of different depths. This one happens to be interacting at eight microns from the window, so very close to where it enters. Um, and now I'm showing all of the 1600 electrons that that produces. And you can see that charge is spread over a very large area, spread over many of these eight micron pixels. All right, here is uh, again, a six keV photon. This one happens to penetrate to 65 microns. Um, but you can see that charge, even though it's not drifting nearly as far, that charge is still spread over lots of uh, pixels. And the key here is that you need to be able to sum all of this charge in order to reconstruct the energy of this photon and do real imaging spectroscopy, which is what we want to do. All right. Um, each pixel, however, contributes some noise. And so that gets summed up uh, and that degrades your energy resolution. That degrades how well you can measure the energy of these uh, events. Okay. So what you should take away from this is this charge diffusion uh, really impairs our soft response. And there are lots of elements that go into this. What I'm showing here is uh, what, again, we call the response of the instrument to an ensemble of monochromatic X-rays. And the, the panels on the left are for 0.3 keV photons, carbon K photons. Uh, on the right, these are for half a keV photons or oxygen K photons. And the top panels show what I would think is a, uh, uh, a, very, um, a, a very good model of a detector for uh, soft response. It has fairly large pixels, so you're not incorporating nearly as much noise. Uh, you don't have to sum up as many pixels, in other words. Um, it has a very high voltage, so that electric field is very strong inside of the detector and derives the electron, the photoelectrons very quickly to the um, where they're collected. Um, and I didn't mention this, but this just means that the surface quality is good. Um, the, the, you don't have to worry about losing electrons at that entrance window. Uh, and so what we want to see for this response is a very uh, narrow Gaussian, which is very close to the expected energy of the photon. That's shown by this dotted line here. And then the different colors I have here are for different levels of noise. This is the, uh, for example, in red is shown four electrons. This is the RMS noise that you sum for every pixel that you have to sum up. Um, and even that at four electrons is not terrible, but you can see as you decrease the noise because of this pixel summing, um, you greatly improve that response. This bottom panel shows what I would say a more challenging uh, detector design for soft response, where we have smaller pixels, meaning we just have to add up some of more of them. So we sum up a lot more noise. Um, we don't have a very strong or as strong an electric field. And our uh, entrance window, for some reason, is just not very good. And we tend to lose electrons there uh, due to recombination. Um, and so you can see, first of all, while some of these look Gaussian, especially for the low noise ones, they're far away. The peak is far away from where you expect. And in fact, for the high noise uh, version, there are no events detected because they are just assumed to be noise. And so this is ser a serious problem. Um, at 0.5 keV, we certainly do significantly better, again, with this, uh, uh, this detector designed for uh, uh, good soft response versus the, just this detector where it's more challenging. All right. OK, and here's a, a bit of a confusogram, but I'm happy to go back to this if anybody wants to, or you can go to the YouTube channel video and pour over it. Um, but the key to take, away, to take away here is that the soft response depends on lots of things, and I'm only showing a couple here. So these two frames show that good detector, that top panel detector, for two different bias voltages, minus 50 and minus 100. And so all we're doing here, we're just, uh, drive, we're just increasing the driving force with which the electrons are collected. Um, and then I'm plotting versus the readout noise in the top panel, the full width half max of that Gaussian. So just the width of this of these uh, Gaussians that you should see here. Uh, the, the axis requirement is very similar to the requirement for links. It's uh, somewhere between 60 and 70 EV full width half max. And what I want you to take away from this is really no matter what your uh, voltage is in this case, 
um, the readout noise has this huge effect on the full width half max. Um, for fairly high noise, uh, these two bands, sorry, these two bands show the, the modeled full width half max at those two energies, 0.5 and 0.3 keV. Um, and we really need to get below about three electrons RMS noise in order to start to get into this band. And we do a little bit better if we can run at higher voltage, but um, we still, you know, noise seems to be the overriding factor here. Okay, so that's a consideration. We need to design these detectors that we can run very fast to avoid pileup, but they also have to have very low noise for this, uh, this very important soft response to be, to be maximized. Okay, so I'm going to switch now and talk about um, how we're designing this and some of the first performance metrics that we have. Uh, before I do that, um, I want to mention that the detectors that we're developing for AXIS um, uh, draw on this long line of heritage going back 30 years to the first use of X-ray CCDs in orbit. Those were flown on ASCA, uh, which launched in 1993. And these were MIT Lincoln Lab CCDs. And then over the three decades since then, uh, uh, further instruments have been built for uh, further uh, X-ray observatories, including the ACES CCDs, which are still operating very well on Chandra after uh, almost uh, 24 years in orbit. Um, uh, moving on to 2005, when the Suzaku when Suzaku launched and the CCDs on Suzaku XIS were direct descendants of the Chandra uh, CCDs, uh, and those again performed very well in a very different orbital environment for 10 years. Um, and uh, further to Osiris Rex, which again uh, used uh, direct descendants of these CCDs. And so we've capitalized on this long history of heritage for the CCDs that we are uh, designing to fly on axis. Here's uh, simply a, um, a rendering of how we will lay out uh, the axis focal plane. And if you're familiar with the uh, Chandra Asus I array, this looks a lot like it for a lot of reasons. Axis is very similar um, to, uh, to, to Chandra. Um, and so the, the focal plane we've envisioned is actually very similar to the Asus focal plane with some key differences. Um, so we're baselining a two by two array of CCDs. Each of these CCDs, uh, again, like the Asus CCDs are frame store CCDs. They have eight readouts. The ASIS and Suzaku XAS CCDs have four readouts. Um, those readouts will have to go substantially faster. Um, it's actually fairly modest size. There are only eight megapixels. Each pixel is, again, the same size um, that we use on ASIS and XIS, 24 microns, uh, which is sufficient to sample the, uh, the PSF of the axis mirrors. Uh, the key differences are that we need to run at least five frames per second with a goal of running at 20 frames per second. So this is up to 70 times the frame rate of the Chandra ASIS. Um, and they have to be about twice as thick as uh, Chandra ASIS and the XIS, uh, Suzaku XIS uh, backside illuminated CCD so that we can get that really good hard X-ray response as well. Okay, so we have developed the prototype. We meaning uh, uh, MIT Lincoln Lab has fabricated this and we are now testing this uh, in our labs on campus at MIT um, and Stanford University also. Uh, this shows a little picture of it. Um, we're calling this uh, a CCID 89. Uh, just for comparison, uh, Suzaku XIS flew a CCID 41. Um, the uh, ASIS devices, I believe, were CCID 17s. Uh, that gives you some indication um, of the development of these imaging, these sorts of imaging devices at Lincoln Lab over the years. Uh, these particular devices are 2K by 1K. They are, again, 24 micron pixels, so the same pixel pitch as we will fly on axis. Um, they are not the same uh, aspect, not, not the same form factors what will fly on axis, but in fact, they have the same number of pixels and the same number of output nodes. Um, so in a lot of respects, they are very high fidelity prototypes for what we will eventually fly on axis. Uh, we're operating them right now at um, two megahertz uh, serial rate. So that's the rate at which each output is outputting pixels. Uh, and if you do the math, that's equivalent to seven frames per second for axis. So above our requirement. Uh, I will show results from this in the next slide. Um, the technical advances that make this possible, uh, actually there are several of them. I, I'd say the two most important ones, uh, if you're familiar with CCDs, you know that once the charge is collected in those pixels in the movies I showed, then it's moved bucket brigade from pixel to pixel down to the, uh, the output node. Um, in the previous incarnations of CCDs, such as been flying on Shatter and Suzaku, um, we need fairly high voltages to do that transfer, uh, but Lincoln Lab has designed a new uh, uh, gate structure, a new gate design 
that allows very fast transfers with very low voltage swings. And so, in fact, we can get the, the transfer rate we need with about the power that, uh, of the CCDs that are um, flying on, on Chandra. Uh, in addition, we need, again, very low noise. And so um, a lot of work has been going into uh, developing a redesigned on-chip amplifier that will allow us to read out as quickly as we need to with very low noise. And so these are some results from that. This is um, uh, performance from that CCD that I just showed. So this is uh, over here on the y-axis, I'm showing the noise. This is RMS electrons, which is how we usually characterize noise as a function of temperature. Uh, axis will actually fly, right now we're baselining to fly at minus 90 degrees. Um, but you can see for each of these eight outputs shown in different colors and different symbols, uh, as we get cooler, the, the noise improves to the point where we have six of these eight outputs operating uh, below four electrons RMS noise and, and, and several of them operating below three electrons RMS noise. Um, so we're well on the way to show that we, uh, we, can, um, uh, we have the low noise uh, that we require at the speeds that we're operating. I should point out, this is operating at two megahertz. So this is operating at the equivalent of seven frames per second. All right, um, over here, this is showing the response, uh, meaning how well we can measure the energy again, uh, to photons at about 6 keV, and we're getting 135 eV full of tap max, which is well below our requirement for axis. Now, I did a bit of a bait and switch because the first half of this talk, I talked all about the uh, low energy response and how important that is. Um, that testing is, under, is, uh, is underway right now in our lab. So I don't have any results to show from that, um, but stay tuned, especially if you're going to be at the head meeting in Hawaii. We hope to have some uh, new results that we'll show there. All right. Um, so once the uh, the CCDs read out the signal, that signal has to go through a stage of amplification, uh, multiple stages of amplification, so that it can make it the foot or so uh, distance to our analog electronics box. So some of that amplification is done on the CCD, um, but a very important step is to do it, it right off the CCD, but very close. And so our colleagues at Stanford have been working on developing uh, an ASIC-based external amplifier. Uh, this ASIC is, a, is an application-specific integrated circuit, and if you parse that, all that means is it's a little chip that you designed to do a very particular task. And this very particular task that this MCRC chip is being designed to do is to buffer and amplify the signal from these CCDs. So this is a little picture of, uh, or, or the location of where this ASIC will eventually go. It's not there now, but that's where it will plug in. Um, and you can see the size of it. It's very small, uh, and this will have eight outputs each uh, reading an output from this from its uh, CCD um, and buffering and amplifying that signal. Uh, the reason that we need to do this is that because we're running so fast, um, the traditional off uh, external amplifiers we have been using uh, just require too much power. And so we've demonstrated that this ASIC, this MCRC, um, can uh, perform the amplification we need with 10 times lower power than these big uh, external amplifiers that we just have for uh, lab use. And so we'll be testing this with the CCD soon. Um, this shows how well it performs. Uh, you don't really need to understand a whole lot about this plot, except this is time. And so this one cycle is equivalent to a five megahertz pixel rate, significantly faster than we need to operate. Uh, the y-axis is showing the voltage um, of different clocks in this ASIC. And the key here is that these rises and these falls are very fast and the flat parts, the flat parts of the waveform are very flat. And that's exactly what we need to get the low noise that we need. Um, so stay tuned for more updates on that. Again, there'll be updates at the head meeting in Hawaii. All right. And then finally, I don't have uh, very much time to talk about this, um, but once, the, uh, once all of those pixels are read out and amplified and digitized, you end up with a lot of data. So you end up with a, uh, 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 8 million pixels of data um, five times a second or up to 20 times a second if we meet our, our goal of frame rate. Um, so that's a huge amount of data and there's no way that we can actually telemetry that all to the ground. And so what we do, which is similar to what, again, missions have been doing for 30 years, is to turn those images um, into a, a set of uh, candidate events. And so we look for little islands of signal in the images and declare those as um, candidate x-rays and then uh, telemeter some information about those. And that's what you get on the ground as an event list. Um, now, again, this has been going on for 30 years, but we're now in a regime where we have to do this a lot faster on board. And so our uh, colleagues at Penn State 
have been developing this thing called the event recognition processor, which is a high-speed FPGA-based uh, event finder that processes the pixels, performs any sort of math that needs to be done on the pixel-based signals, um, and then identifies these events and characterizes them and sends just that information down. Uh, and so by doing that, we're able to reduce our two gigabit per, sec per second image data down by a factor of 10,000 so it can fit into our, uh, uh, our available band bandwidth for telemetry. Uh, in addition, our colleagues at Penn State are working on this transient alert monitor. That event stream will be sent into this, another FPGA-based uh, algorithm that um, compares the events and their location on the sky uh, to an onboard source catalog. And then if it sees a brand new uh, source in a location where it wasn't expecting it, or if it sees a known source change flux, it triggers, triggers an alert that is then sent down. Um, this is based on a lot of development work that this group has done for the uh, Athena WFI, um, which uh, in the end is not flying this as a hardware component, but this work is invaluable for what we will eventually do on Axis. And so that's all I wanted to say. I do wanna leave you with um, uh, the fact that this is a very simple design based on what we have done on Chandra and Suzaku and other heritage missions. Um, the real challenge is that we need to run a lot faster than those missions. And that poses a lot of challenge for the soft response, but we have good technical ways of, of overcoming that. Um, and so I will leave it there uh, simply to say that our technology demonstration is continuing on schedule. Um, please come by our posters and our talks at the head meeting to learn more. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, silent clap. Um, we have a, a, a few minutes for questions. If anyone has questions for Eric, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, uh, Rick, I see your hand is up. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I was just wondering on your plot of noise versus temperature, why weren't all eight of them the same? Yeah, that's a um, that is a very good question. I will say this is this is based on one of the first devices that we got, and so. Um, uh, Lincoln was still hammering out some work um, with the uh, the fabrication of this. So we're still we are still learning things about these devices. That's part of the answer. Um, another part of the answer is that you there are a lot of settings uh, that you can use to tune the the noise, um, especially settings of the the voltages of the output gates and things like that. Um, and so uh, doing that tuning is something that we need to do. And so I, I think that tuning worked, for example, for these and not necessarily for those. Um, so they were differently tuned. Yeah. Or, or they were, uh, they needed to be differently tuned is one reason. Yeah. So the, the eight chips aren't all identical? The eight, the eight, this is one chip. These are eight readouts yeah, okay. from this chip. That's the right. out, So oh. the eight outputs are not all identical for this chip. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yep. Yeah. And as I said, we're getting, you know, we're, we're getting new chips um, uh, where a lot of these issues have been, uh, have been and are continuing to be worked out. Okay, uh, Mike, is that a question from you? Yeah, so I, I, I've been asked this several times, so I'll, I'll ask you too. So the energy dependent, you know, subpixel event repositioning that, that Chandra has done, will this just be kind of less necessary or is this something, because it's something people are always interested in for, you know, really bright sources, what, what, what can you do? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll say, actually, I wanted to start the movie, so let me see if I can figure out how to start these movies. All right because this will give us a little visual aid. Um, I think this will be very useful for uh, access. I, I don't know that it's necessary, but it's certainly possible. And I think we can certainly use it um, because we don't have very small pixels. The pixel size we'll have is actually three by three of these eight micron pixels. And so you can see uh, we're not, we probably won't have very many, many pixel events. We'll have one, two, three, four pixel events. However, um, we can use these simulations and in addition to some measurements that our colleagues at Penn State have done um, to understand that when you get a single pixel event, meaning when all of your signal, your confidence is in a single pixel, there's only there are only a limited number of ways that could have happened. The photon um, had to be in a particular location projected over that pixel. Uh, and so that's sort of the, the basis of this, the Edzer thing as well. Um, based on the grade that we get, meaning the pixel pattern, 
um, we can actually locate the the location of the photon to significantly better than a pixel. And I estimate we can probably uh, get the the location of it to about 0.2 arc seconds, 0.3 arc seconds. It's a little energy dependent, but something like that.